It's the Oatly Academy Artcast, episode 98. Interview with animation layout and visual development artist John Navarez, part one. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Artcast by the Oatly Academy of Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatly, director of the Oatly Academy and your host. I was a character designer and visual development artist at Disney, and now I teach full-time and produce this show where I help you make a living from your own imagination. Find more art and story podcasts from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, kids' books, VFX, and comics at oatleyacademy.com forward slash shows. approaches his art and his relationships the same way. Whether he encounters a new blank page or a new person, John sees the opportunity to freely explore new and inspiring ideas. The whimsical energy in his sketches combined with his delightful personality has made him one of the most reputable professionals in the animation industry. His stellar career spans from storyboard revisionist to visual development artist with stops along the way at every major animation studio, including Disney, Sony, Illumination, and Pixar. Today we discuss John's iconic, visceral drawing style, just saying no to your eraser, and what two dozen rejection letters gets you. With your free membership to the Oatly Academy Brush Club, you'll get a new set of custom Photoshop brushes every month for a year, plus a how-to video for each new brush set. Here's a sneak peek at the brushes you'll receive. Stylized scatter brushes for cartoony worlds, tree brushes for naturalistic foliage, perspective brushes for environment design, bug brushes for designing creepy creatures, heavy metal brushes for industrial textures, and lots more. Go to oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash Oatly brushes and sign up today. That's oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash Oatly, O-A-T-L-E-Y brushes. It's a whole year of new inspiration and it's 100% free. Again, go to oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash Oatly brushes and get your first brush set today. John, take us all the way back. When did you first, you know, get the inclination that you were uh, talented? Let's see. The first inclination I was talented. Um, I always kind of drew as a kid, but I always kind of drew for fun. Right. But a lot of people said really cool things or nice things like, oh, you draw really well. Mm-hmm. Or oh, I, like, I like how you draw. And I was the kid in class who, who, who drew. So, you know, a lot of people said, oh, draw this for me and stuff like that. And, and that was cool. But uh, I just remember my teachers making remarks like, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're good. And I remember this specifically where it was fifth grade and I was uh, considered for the gifted program. So I took the test and part of the test involved me drawing something. And they said it was my drawing that really impressed them. And I was like, huh, okay. So it was cool. I mean, you know, it was cool because I I was able to kind of take these extra classes, which were really interesting. But I think that was the first point that I realized, oh, my drawing kind of, you know, it was validated. Yeah, it, yeah. Brought, it, it, it brought something on. And, yeah. You know, I, I was young. I didn't really think too much of it, but that was the first thing I can remember that kind of it was acknowledged for something. Yeah, so, that's yeah. interesting. I, I'm thinking now about a watercolor painting that I think my, my parents still have. I feel like I've seen it fairly recently. That won some award at my elementary school. Mm -hmm. And I did that painting when I was in third grade. And, you know, I mean, it looks like a third grade painting, but it won it won something. And I remember 
like you're saying, there was something about that external validation that fueled the fire of inspiration more than than just about anything else. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's like you know, you have these early impressions, and you know, you don't really think anything of it, but yeah. when you when you when, when it when it is noticed, you kind of oh, that's that's new, you know? Yeah. I just I remember that vividly. It's like oh, that's cool. Yeah, right. And and then yeah, and like you were just saying, like the fact that it your art opened a door. Mm -hmm. It's easy to assume that art opens doors when you're thinking in the context of like the animation industry or something. But yeah. to but to to get that idea is so pivotal and to get that idea at a, a young age that art is valid as opposed to just the default uh, purpose of art is a hobby or, you know, whatever that other some, the, there, there are certain assumptions that, that folks have about art. And to sort of be spared those assumptions <laughs> at a very yeah. early age is, is really important. Yeah. And so where you grew up in Southern California? I did. I grew up in East L.A. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I was born in East L.A. Uh -huh. I was raised in East L.A. But, you know, the great thing, I was, I was with my mom. and So, yeah, I went to Garfield High School. So then at Garfield High School, did you have art classes? I mean, or was that mostly you still were doing art on your own? No, I um, I was just kind of doing art. Of my, there really wasn't a class or anything. Uh -huh. You know, I just kind of I remember uh, I had one. Of, yeah, I remember one of the toughest teachers in the, in the school. Her name was Miss Urban, and she was tough. I mean, everybody was kind of like scared of her. But I remember I had her, and she was really cool with me. I mean, she was tough, but yeah, I guess she took me under her wing, and she really. I mean, I remember she went out of her way and just kind of helped me out and stuff. And I remember her commenting me on my drawing, and. and uh, that was great. It was nice. Yeah, that's amazing. What? Yeah, again, that just that validation and the power of that. And so, then, why were you drawing? I mean, did you just always draw, and then your mom sort of, in, you know, encouraged it, or how? Did, how did you get good at that stage? You know, I, that it obviously was remarkable in some way. You know, I kind of always drew as a kid, but mm -hmm. you know, I just, I just drew for fun. I remember right. drawing dinosaurs. That was the first thing I remember drawing because oh, yeah. my mom would take me to take us to. Uh, Gosh, what was it the LA County Museum, uh -huh. which was the Natural History Museum, which is right next to USC. Yeah. We're actually we lived there for a while there too, and I remember going there a lot and seeing the dinosaurs. And I remember buying little cast iron dinosaurs, and I remember just drawing dinosaurs all the time. Yeah, and so it, I just kind of drew for fun, you know. Not, I would just you know nothing serious. I just drew, right. just draw to draw. Yeah. So yeah, it was. Uh, I remember junior high. I would take a, I would take a, a drawing class. That was a class like oh. Hey, I'm drawing. Yeah, you know, I had fun there. And I remember taking a drafting class, which really wasn't drawing. It was more like mechanical drawing. Um, hmm. You know, drawing stuff with you know with sizes and, and perspective, and you're kind of it's mechanical right. drawing, really. But I remember it's like it was the closest thing to drawing, so I still <laughs> had fun doing that. That's interesting. Yeah, I had all kinds of art classes in high school. I had by my senior year, I was uh, spending I think three hours out of every day. Wow, that's in great. In the art studio. Yeah. Wow, it was like it's like it's almost like half your half your uh, schedule was like, was on, was in the arts. Yeah, That's exactly, great. it's pretty crazy. It was anyway. My point being, I, I hear about this. I hear about high school students or or even younger um, not having really any engagement with art, and then here I am. By my senior year, I was doing oil paintings. Wow, like still lifes of flowers and things. You yeah, know? you started early. That's great. I mean, yeah. it's, you almost it's almost like a. It was almost like a job you were doing. Yeah. You know? It's almost like you had an early version of college. Like, yeah. oh, here's, here's my, here's my, uh, my schoolwork. And then right. I'm also happy to do this on the side to, to get by kind of thing. It's exactly. Like, That's exactly the way it was. It's fascinating. And so, but, that, but then it makes me really uh, appreciate uh, your experience because, I mean, you had teachers, obviously, that you've already mentioned here that were encouraging you as an intellectual and as a maybe a creative person but not necessarily someone teaching you about core shadows or you know mm -hmm. measuring with the pencil or any of that kind of thing yeah so to jump way ahead for a brief moment your work i mean there's just so much freedom in your drawings and there's a lot of uh, craft and, and structure that we'll get into and like we'll get into concepting and that kind of thing but just purely in the energy do you know what I mean like the way uh -huh. you make marks there's something I don't know so it's 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 controlled but it's also very spontaneous and every time I talk to you about this 
you know, a lot of artists, I think, really get in their own heads and they get like they sit down at the canvas and that almost tri- like this Pavlovian trigger kind of response they have where we're just fear kind of it's like, OK, there's always going to be some fear there. And I'm just kind of trying to just mitigate that as best as possible. And come on, guys, just power through. Come on. It's not that scary. You know, and they just kind of like get all tense. And and it's like you seem to approach the blank page or the canvas in this just very free, like exploratory, like unafraid kind of way. Yeah, I do remember drawing really tight when I was a kid. But then I think the big thing that really kind of got me loosened up was when I took a lot of gesture drawings mm-hmm. in, uh, in college, when I worked for the school newspaper and I was an art major, that I took all these live drawing classes and there's nothing but gesture, gesture, gesture. And, you know, the other stuff was like sculpture and clay and stuff. Like, and that was great too, but the gesture drawing was really something I gravitated towards. And uh, I just remember studying all these artists that had a very loose style. And I think that, and then working for the school newspaper, because, you know, working for the school newspaper, you had to draw fast. And that was kind uh. of the, 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 that was the foundation. I, I, you know, I kind of give credit to that for helping me, I guess, not get started, but at least kind of get comfortable with storyboarding. You know, you give an idea, you're given an idea and you have to draw for the school newspaper. I show up at five or so they give me the article or the, what I have to do. And I had till midnight to turn it in because one o'clock they have to get to the printer. This is right. when, uh, before digital newspapers. It was old, right. oh, yeah. old school. So you have yeah. to like, you know, there's, there's a deadline. It's like you have to turn in your work by this time or it's not going to be printed. Right. But that made me work fast. So everything was done really quick. But yeah, it was just, I just remember just, you know, earlier before college, I just remember drawing, but I just remember in college, I do remember there was this freedom of gestures that I really kind of leaned on and the, I, I just felt comfortable. Wow. I, I, I just love the, the energy. And, there was, you know, the gesture drawing was just really quick, you know, one minute, two minute, five minute. I hated drawing long poses because I sucked at it. I didn't have the patience for it. <laughs> so I just... You know, anything beyond like half an hour was really painful because I started making stuff up and I just like, no, I just like doing, you know, getting it down on paper and go, can we just kind of do it as many as possible? <laughs> so, um, that was me. I would kind of, you know, that's when I kind of remember just drawing fast, but that was okay. Right. And, and I guess I didn't know any better because I, I really didn't have the patience to, to, to go right. beyond the cleanup stage. But, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you you fuss less than just about any artist I know. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it, well, I mean, I've seen I've seen you draw like just kind of a start to finish sketch, like a character sketch or something, maybe ten times in the time that that, I, that I've known you, and every time it's like you know it's it's obviously it's going on in your head, so it's hard to to tell from the outside, which I'm absolutely fascinated by, but. It's almost like you formulate an idea, like you do some work at the beginning, just mentally, where you'll kind of look at the page and you'll like kind of hover your hand over the page a bit without making any marks, really. Or you might make some super light marks Mm -hmm. and then and correct me if I'm wrong. It's almost as if you're like, as long as I get that gesture right, like everything else is going to be okay. Like there's something about like it seems like when once you have kind of found the general flow of that drawing then it's like the roller coaster, like going up that first hill and then it like cuts loose. And then like the drawing just kind of like happens in a very rhythmic kind of way. I think so. Yeah. I kind of, I do, I do kind of like, you know, I, I start the page. I'm trying to think like, you know, in my head, I kind of have an idea and then I kind of like ghost it around yeah. and then I just kind of, Oh, okay. And then once it feels right, I just kind of, I still keep it loose, but I'm just trying to fill out the forms and then I yeah. kind of like, okay, then I go back. And I try not to erase too much. There's a liberating feeling when you can, when you know you don't have to erase or, or draw over or, or not clean up. You just kind of get the idea down. And then you just keep drawing over the idea. And then you can solidify the idea with form or, or just kind of fine-tuning a line or making a line bolder or something mm-hmm. like that. But, I mean, that's what I like. It just, you know, yeah. I, just, I like that. I just like going for it. And, yeah. you know, it's okay. <laughs> That is fantastic. It's fantastic. It's just so, it's so underrated. Just going for it is so underrated, (laughs) especially with digital tools, right? Is that digital tools are generally speaking more likely to make you want to fuss over things. Yeah, it it can be. Uh, I remember when I was switching over to digital, yeah, there was this kind of like, oh, now I can make it cleaner or something like that. But but after a while I was like, no, I just, there's something missing. There's, there's an energy, there's, 180 or there's kind of just throwing it down 
you know, which is cool. So now I just kind of like yeah. do the same thing on, on digital where I try not to race so much, you know, uh, I try and, and not get too many things on the, on different layers. I started doing that. And after a while I was like, wait, this is becoming too analytical, yeah. too scientific, too, too much. It's like, yeah. just throw it down. When, when drawing, it's like, I try and draw economically. Right. It, I, you know, it's almost a gut feeling too. It's like, you know, when it's there and, you know, or, or it's almost like 80 or 90% there and you're like, okay, you know, it's clear. It's, it's, I have what I want. I'm trying to say and all the things are there. And then sometimes, and I do this a lot where, you know, I'll put it away or, you know, it's done. And then later on, I'll see it many, many years or many months later where I have a fresh eye on it. And then I'll, I can go back and I'm like, oh, maybe I just need yeah. to carry 10 more, 10% more there or whatever. <laughs> and it is that last 10%. I have found that is where I am most likely to screw up the painting. And then the last 10% of what the painting I don't, I don't mean this literally, but kind of what the painting should have been or what maybe what the painting wanted to be uh-huh. becomes the last 70 percent of the work. Right. That's where I like yeah. I make bad decisions. And then I spend just as much time when the painting's almost finished. I spend just as much time uh, chasing ghosts, you know, like like trying to solve problems that aren't there. And I yeah. get tunnel vision and noodly and that kind of thing. And I've realized, man, that last percent, 10 percent is really a pivotal for me where I have to slow down and I go, okay, we're talking about 10 more strokes, mm-hmm. Chris, something like, I mean, like very, very few more strokes, slow down. I mean, I, I'm trying to slow down in general because that actually makes the painting faster. I find, but nonetheless, slow down and think about where you want to place those strokes. And this gets right back to the way that I think you manage to do very gestural drawings that still have a very strong resolution to them is because you'll go, if you're doing a character, like a real cute character or something, you'll go and pay that in that last, you know, whatever the drawing took you, you know, 20 minutes in that last, you know, five, you'll spend that time still moving your hand around as if you're still drawing, but you're not drawing again. Now you're sort of ghosting again, but you'll back off the page, but then you'll like ghost around and then, and then dive in and get like a detail. You like darken a line around the eyes or something like that. So it's like, you're still, it's almost like you're physically trying to hold on like a, like a musician, you know, kind of still trying to hold on to the rhythm, the same rhythm and stay in the same groove. But there's still more time between the actual mark making. Yeah, definitely. It's it's still a thing where you don't want to like you know you want to finish it, but you don't want to go too far. Right. You know, there, there's an invisible line. It's really weird. Like you know, it's hard to say what that line is. Right. But it's it's all gut. You know, yeah. like oh maybe I shouldn't have put that mark, or oh well I didn't have to go that far, or, or it's almost like oh I just ruined what was yeah what was simply said before <laughs> right. kind of thing. Oh man. So many times, so many times. I I just, you know, Oh God, you just feel like this thing is, um, well, great. Now it's kind of a lost cause. Even with, with digital, I find there's, you know, it's like, you're supposed to be able to change anything in digital. And and there's this point where I, I I think more often, well, I can say this for sure with, for me, the longer I do this, the more I realize that digital is just like traditional painting, really, because the energy is really the thing to preserve. Like yeah. the energy is that is the hard thing to maintain that that honest sentiment, that emotion, that message of the piece, uh, that kind of energetic message. And that's the really tough part in that it doesn't matter if I have undoes or if I could like completely delete a certain section of the painting. It doesn't matter the energy, like the connective energy that is connecting all those strokes and that flow that it's gone now. That time has passed. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's a moment thing. It's like, yeah, it, there's an energy there. It's like, Oh, you're just capturing that moment, that energy in that little thing, that, in that little what do you call it, window of time. Which is really, that's, that's gesture. I mean, that is gesture drawing, right? I mean, that's just like, we're just translating gesture drawing into the idea of like making a more finished drawing or even like an animation layout or something, or, or in my case, you know, the things I'm, I'm I'm dealing with my paintings right now. It's the same kind of idea though, right? It's all gesture drawing in a way. Yeah, pretty much. You're just getting it down as fast as you can. You give yourself a limitation of what, 30 seconds or a minute or whatever, but yeah, you're just throwing it down and uh, you commit, you commit and go. And then you just kind of, you go for it. I, it's interesting. I've heard Nathan Falk say on a couple of occasions, there's just no time for that. Like, (laughs) you know, like he'll be like, you know, we just got to get stuff done people. And it's interesting because it's like, Nathan, there is time. 
like we're doing personal work, you know, it's like there, there's as much time as you need, you know, to do whatever you want to do. But, but his point is really compelling, which is this idea of like live in this space of you only have so much just physical energy. Forget about this kind of abstract idea of like the energy of the painting or the drawing. That's part of it too. But even just your, the amount of time you can just sit at the desk and draw, right? Or the amount of time you can just sit at your Wacom tablet and paint, you get tired. Yeah. You just get tired and you just kind of disconnect and you start making stupid mistakes or I'm, I'm speaking for myself. I start making stupid mistakes. And, and I think that's what Nathan's talking about. Where he's like, there's just no time. Like there is a point at which, you know, there's a law of diminishing returns, uh-huh. I think, or something like that, you know, where it's like you just, yeah, you could still get the painting done. You know, it's like I have paintings um, that I've done where I, I know it took three times as long as it should have. And that last 10% that became actually the last 70% and it was just all struggle. You know, I still am happy about the painting. Uh It's just that it definitely is not gestural. It doesn't feel like I painted it in a moment. It feels labored. Yeah. It wasn't like it was like it flew by or, or it just, yeah. Like you said, it feels labored. Like you were working way too much. You're giving way too much thought on it. Which is different than speed, right? Mm-hmm. It's not really about speed, although speed is um, is like a result of the gestural approach to making an image. I think it's true. You know, it's kind of like, you know, if you give yourself a limit, like, you know, like speed, you know, I tell people, it's like, draw something in a minute. And a lot of people who aren't used to that, there's a loss of control. And it's like, it's a comfortable feeling. But it's like, well, just throw it down. Throw it down. It's more of an exercise, like, just throw it down. It's like, don't think about it. Just throw it down. Hmm. And, yeah, what usually happens is, you know, it's a lot of unfinished lines that really don't really say too much. But it's more like, okay, if you keep doing that over an hour or even throughout the day, you will get bolder. The the, the line gets more and more. Uh, you get more comfortable. You're, you're getting warm hand. You're getting all those cobwebs out. You're just kind of getting comfortable. It's the analogy I make of life drawing. Life drawing is usually, what, three hours. The first hour, you know, so you haven't drawn in, in a long time. It's getting, you know, you're like resting, you're like, oh, you know, you're like, oh, this sucks, I hate this, and oh, man, this is this is not how it is, because you haven't drawn in a while. And then the second hour, you're getting a little more comfortable, you know, your hand's getting a little warm, you're like, oh, you know, you're, you're starting to remind yourself, oh, this is fun, I'm getting it, you know, you're, you're getting into that comfortable zone. And then the third hour, you're in the zone, it's like, you know, your hand's warm, and you're loving it, and you're like, yeah, yeah, you know, keep going, keep going, and it's fun. And then what's really sad is after three hours, class is over. And you're like, oh, what happened? I'm just getting warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I always thought, like, well, what if you continued beyond that? What would happen? And that's kind of what you want to strive towards. It's like you always want to just see how far you can go. I mean, I always imagine it would be nice if you had a, a, a figure drawing day instead of a figure drawing class. You know, where right. it's like, okay, after the three hours, take a little break and then keep going. And then see where that takes you. And then there's that freedom, that comfortable thing where you just kind of, oh, imagine what you can do, you know, with that. But speed is one of the things like you just throw it down. But it's like over time, there's a comfort thing where you start enjoying it. And then you start, there's like these wonderful things that can happen. And you're just kind of, oh, just it, you just, you're drawing and, and you so sometimes you, you find out where the drawing takes you. Or a lot of times you just feel comfortable where you're not so scared of putting lines down. (laughs) (laughs) That's it, man. Wow, that's great. So you're in East L.A. Yeah. And you're in the gifted program. You're being affirmed by teachers and authority figures. That's fantastic. So you're you're feeling capable. Yeah. I mean, uh, I remember the drawing got me in, but I, I still didn't, I didn't do anything more to the drawing mm-hmm. or I didn't take any extra drawing classes or anything like that. But mm-hmm. when I was in, when I was in high school, I, I went to Garfield high school and my, I had a really great, awesome teacher, Jaime Escalante, who was kind of portrayed uh, in the movie uh, Stand and Deliver by Edward James Olmos. Oh, right. Um, and awesome. Um, I remember um, that class um, that was depicted in the movie, that was like, I think, three or four years before I actually took him. So it was really fresh. And Wow. I, you know, I remember he was, a, he was a great teacher. And there was another great teacher as well, Ben Jimenez, who together they, they taught the calculus program. And I remember uh, taking that class, and math was fun, and he made it easy. And, you know, I just remember all my, all my friends were taking it. And a lot of my friends were like science majors or engineering majors. So they took a lot of classes like that, too. Right. So I kind of hung with them. 
And at the time, I thought, okay, math, you know, to hear me thinking ahead toward college, it's like, okay, math is a safe thing to do. It's, you right. know, it's like you can be an engineer or something like that. So I thought, okay, math is fun. I'll just continue doing that. So I went to UC Santa Barbara and I declared myself a math major. So I started taking calculus first year, but it was just a repeat of what I kind of in high school. Right. And then I started competing and I started keep, keep doing it. And I was taking engineering calculus, engineering mathematics, and I was doing high end calculus. I remember doing matrices and Ronsky and form all this stuff. It was just high end stuff. And I remember it was my second year in college. It was the end of the second year. I was taking my final. And I remember I didn't feel good about the test. I was like, oh, you know, I, just, I don't think I'm getting it. And then I remember we got our exams. There were eight questions. And I remember staring at the exam at these eight questions. And I just like, I have no idea what I'm looking at. And wow. it was right there. <laughs> Everybody's taking the class, you know, that's what's going on. You know, but here I am. I'm just standing there. I'm just sitting there, actually, and I'm just kind of like just thinking to myself, like, okay, I think I need to make a change. I think and this is this is really what I want to do. Wow. And so I remember I was like, okay, I was just talking to myself, like, okay, do I, I, what should I do? What what do I need to do? What I'm this isn't where I want to be. So long story short, fast forward, I I obviously flunked the class, and then uh, <laughs> I remember getting my class my 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 grades. And it was the third beginning of third year, and uh, I remember getting an academic probation letter, and all my buddies were saying like, "Oh, just go to the dean, you know, just tell them that you're going to switch majors." And, and by this time, I was saying like, "Oh, maybe I should do art." So I go to the dean, and the dean didn't want to hear anything of it, and he kicked me out. And he says, "You can't, no, I don't, you know, you wow. maybe you should, maybe you should rethink this somewhere else." And wow, um, that just devastated me because I was like, I was I was the first of my family to go to college. And I felt, oh, I really let my family down. And I was so oh my God. ashamed. So I went back home and I'm like, oh. But it's funny because my mom and dad didn't take it that hard. In fact, they were really supportive. And they're like, oh, well, it's okay. But I took it hard because I right. felt like I let them down. And, and so were you learning about artists or researching artists during that time throughout high school? And Not really. I mean, I don't remember taking a class uh -huh. or anything during that time. Actually, when I got kicked out, I stayed up at Santa Barbara City College. I went to City College for a semester, and I took like a, a Mesoamerican studies where it was pretty much we were learning Mexican history. I remember uh, looking at murals, and that's when I was introduced to like uh, like Orozco and Siqueiros mm. and, and Diego Rivera. And then I was like, oh, oh. You know, art and all that stuff. And they had a very cool arts library at UC Santa Barbara. And I remember I would spend time there. Um, okay. Just looking at stuff. And I didn't know what I was looking at. I was like, I was just right. casually like, oh, okay, I know Michelangelo. I, was, I know Leonardo. Right. But, you know, fast, again, fast forward when I went back again as, a, as an art student, then I went back to that same library. And then I really, I spent a lot of time in that library. I would take books out and I would just look at artists. And I was, oh my God. I was like, who are these artists? And all these great artists, all these European artists, all these South American artists, all these, yeah. you know, uh, these Chinese artists, these Japanese artists that I never heard of before, but I just was gravitating toward the art because now I was like, um, now, now I was getting excited. Yeah, um, right. But th this was after <laughs> me being kicked right. out. And yeah, going back. Yeah, it's like the uh, the safe bridge had to crumble. Yeah, for me to actually try and find a way over myself. And Isn't that amazing? And yeah. then I love it though. Like once it's like, oh man, well that didn't work out. So you just dive in with all that, clearly that commitment that had you pretty competent at math, <laughs> you wouldn't have gotten as, as far, you know what I mean? You wouldn't have gotten that far if yeah. you hadn't had the commitment and the ability to focus and, and apply yourself to math to get, to get as far as you did. So it's like, then you can apply that stuff to, to your art now that all that energy. Yeah. I was just, you know, um, it, it was fun, but then I realized I, at the end, it wasn't something I really wanted to do. Right. I, I wasn't happy. You know, that, that was, that's what it came down to. I wasn't really happy, but then I kind of like, you know, I didn't know the answer then what made me happy. Right. I just knew like, okay, just to, just to suit my wounds, I took a drawing class and that made me happy. But then I didn't make the connection of animation or drawing. Right. I just knew that drawing made me happy. And then when I went back home to East LA College and lived with my mom after I got kicked out, I remember going to East LA College and I took a live drawing class. Uh, it was just one live drawing class. It was a Wednesday night for three hours. And I remember that was, that was the best three hours of my life. 
<laughs> at, at that time. Uh-huh. And, that, and then, you know, I started drawing, taking a drawing class and I would take a few more classes. And then I just made the connection like, oh, uh, I think this is what I should do. Wow. And, um, yeah. Did you so, have like a day job or something or? Yeah, I worked, I was working for the, the, um, uh, first I worked for the, uh, city police department. I was a clerk where if you wanted to be a, a policeman or a fireman for the city of LA, there was an 800 number you call. And most likely I was the one who answered that, wow. that, that call. And I would tell you how to become a cop or how to become a fireman. You know, I would tell you like, oh, there's seven tests you got to take. And this is where they're testing at the police academy. Uh, this is what's required. Uh, this is what you need to know and blah, blah, blah. Wow. So, that's fascinating. Yeah. Oh my God. And so then your drawing class was on Wednesday nights. And so you sort of look forward to that day. Yeah. It was, it was, it was the highlight of the, wow. of the week. Like, you know, I was drawing. And so that yeah. was a year. That took three years. Three, actually, about, three about, years. About, about two and a half or three years. And then after those three years at East LA college, I built enough credits where I could, I could go back to UC Santa Barbara right. as an art major. So I went back and I was older. And by that, by that time, a lot of my buddies that I started school with were either just about to graduate or right. graduated. And so I was with a new class, you right. know, that were, that were just a few years younger, but you know. So you yeah. were in your late twenties by that point? <laughs> Actually, yeah. no, not really late twenties. I was more like 23. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. It took, took, took a little bit. I mean, I remember graduating when I was 25. Okay. Yeah. You graduated at 25. All right. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. So then what happened next? You graduate. Do you have an animation context yet or it's, you have an art degree in the general sense? How does that work? Well, I have a, I had a, a studio art degree, okay. which was kind of like a fine art degree where, okay. you know, I kind of took these art classes and, you know, like little sta- uh, I did some uh, sculpture. I did some oil painting and live drawing and, and it was great. But now it came time to find a job. So at this point, I was working for the gas company, and the Lion King movie had just come out. Okay. And I was like, huh, maybe I should consider that. So I, the movie had just come out, and all of a sudden, all these studios wanted to do animation, and it was a great time. But I was in this weird thing where it's like, okay, I need to do that. I want to do that. Well, really, what my appetite was, it wasn't the movie, but it was the art of Lion King book. That yeah. really my appetite because it was there that I first made the connection like, oh, all right. my gesture drawings, look what they do. I always thought animation was fine line drawing and I kind of removed myself. I was like, okay, that wasn't for me. But when I open up the book, you see all these story sketches mm-hmm. and all these really great, cool concept sketches and they were really loose and they were beautiful, that energy. And that was kind of, that was a light bulb. I was like, oh, there's more to animation than just fine line animation drawings. You know, I, I, I was naive. I didn't know any better, but that, wow. I remember that was like, Oh, I want to do this. So I remember, uh, that was the start of me applying everywhere and getting like over two dozen rejection letters oh and, and over a year and a half, nobody answered, you know, nobody wanted me. But the thing is I was too dumb enough to quit. I didn't know any better. Right. But I just kept knocking on the door. And I remember there was a phone call by an operator and I used to call the same operator over at Disney. I, I got so good where I knew all the numbers of all the studios <laughs> by heart and I got to know the voices of the operators and I'm sure they got to know my voice like, oh, this is long again. But I, it, it, was a, it was a habit that I made over, the, over two years. And anyway, this one lady at the Walt Disney TV studio, she says, well, there's no, there's no, hire, there's no jobs right now. No one's hiring right now. But she says, have you heard of this training program? And I'm like, no. And she told me there's a storyboard training program that Walt Disney TV Animation's doing. And, you know, maybe you'd be interested. And I'm like, sure. She sent me the information. And that was the start of me sending, you know, I applied. And the nutshell of the whole thing was they wanted people who had no experience but raw drawing skills. Yeah. That they, that they could kind of um, yeah. nerves and, and grow. And they would pay them over a year, a year and a half. And then they would hire as storyboard artists. So that way they, they trained them in house, so to speak. Oh my so, God. So, you know, I applied and I got in. So it, I was one of nine people that got in and this was in 97 of October and it was great. And I was like, I was like 31. And, um, I remember they, it was a paying gig and they paid pretty well. They paid $800 a week. Um, and it was awesome. And it was film school meets art school. Awesome. You took, you took life drawing, you took anatomy drawing, you took uh, gesture drawing, 
you looked at films, you did improv classes, you, you had one-on-one mentoring with a storm artist who would teach you storyboard skills and all this other stuff. It was great on paper. So we started doing all these improv and acting classes. It was fun. It was yeah. awesome. So this is October. So we go to Christmas break, and then we come back, and it was about January 5th of 98. And then they all brought us together, and they said, well, we have some bad news. We're killing the program because at the time, mm-hmm. Disney doesn't think that this program is very profitable. And it wasn't. It was, it was a training program. And this was the time when all the features weren't doing as well as Lion right. King so that everybody had to like cut back. And uh, one of the casualties was this program. Yeah, because kind of one of the first glimpses of the 2D apocalypse that was it, to come. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody all of a sudden got scared, and then they, you know the big numbers weren't there. And, yeah. You know, it's kind of and, and you know it just a lot. It was things were had things the, were just had the Florida studio opened yet? You know, I'm trying to remember. Yes, they did. It was yeah. because this was also the time uh, Mulan and Mulan was done in Florida. Uh, so yeah, so okay. yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember they, they took us into a room and they said, we can only keep two of the nine of you. Um, wow. So I was number three. So I uh, was actually, I was like, oh, and I remember I, I was really sad. But the guy who ran the program, Larry Johnson, he went up to, he went up to bat for me. And he actually told Disney, he's like, you know, give, um, you know, give this guy a shot, you know, give, you know. And before I knew it, the next week, I was on Pepper Ran as a storyboard revisionist. And it was awesome because I was like, I didn't know anything about storyboards. I still didn't know anything about storyboards or, or storyboard revisions, but I was on a show and I, that was the beginning of my career. It's awesome. Did you get a raise at that time? Mm, I know. I think they still paid me at $800 a week, which is still good. I, I, was, right. I wasn't complaining. It was like, wow, right. it's nice. Right. Yeah. I was wondering if, because it went from effectively a, a glorified internship to, you know, like a production job, I was wondering if they, uh, you know, I don't remember it being major. If it yeah. was, it was pretty right. It was pretty small. That sounds pretty Disney. Yeah, actually. yeah. <laughs> but 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 you know, but at the time, I didn't care because I was like, oh, right. I survived. I'm, I'm still here. Right. right. Exactly. Oh, I know. It's huge. Yeah. And and so you. So what was going on? What was going on in TV at the time? They were starting this new wave of of of, of shows. I remember the shows that were then. Where that were there were was our show Pepper Ann. Uh-huh. There was also Recess. Oh yeah. Gosh, I'm trying to think what other shows. There was a few other shows, but they they came like about a, a couple years after. Uh-huh. One was Fillmore. Yeah, right. Uh, another was a wannabe Ren and Stimpy show. That whole that that was kind of that last Disney afternoon. Lineup. Yeah, and exactly. uh, and yeah, a lot of those shows. I remember thinking this is like Disney's impression of Nickelodeon. Pretty much, yeah. That's that's kind of what it was. They were trying to mimic uh, Nickelodeon's success, uh-huh. and uh, yeah, they had all these shows, which is great because it wasn't just one show. There was many shows happening, and you know, when I started, I, I met all these great artists, and I was exposed to all these great folks I didn't know before. It was the beginning of, of my career, but it was also the beginning of my education. Yeah, and I was like, wow, I was in the best place at the best time, and uh, yeah, I remember getting to meet all these people. It was great too. It was like everybody had their own camp in the building, so the Pepper Ann folks were in one area. But I would always migrate down the hall, yeah. Oh, yeah. To recess folks, and got to know those guys. And I would migrate upstairs to the other show, got to know those guys. So we knew each other, but um, you know, it was great. Oh, it's and, so cool. Uh, and what I did was part of my education, or my so-called education that I that I put upon me was. You know, I was a storyboard revisionist, which is great. You know, for those who don't know it, it's like a storyboard revisionist is a storyboard artist who works with the director, but you're doing minor changes. So it's mm-hmm. so you don't disrupt the schedule uh, of, the, of the storyboard person. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, they do the storyboards. Yeah. So any minor changes, they needed someone, and that was that was me. And I would, instead of a hand going up, they want the hand going down. Okay, I would mm-hmm. just erase it with the hand going down instead of a smile, a frown. I would make small changes or change dialogue. Any small changes, yeah. somebody had to do it. And that they was, need that a little fun. piece of animation. Like exactly. they need like the something to move or something like that. Something yeah. minor. And it yeah. was just minor. So it was great because I learned. I was learning what a director wanted. I mm. was learning on the job. And it was great. And I did that for about a year and a half. And at the same time, the Disney TV studio had a, had a library. And it was basically a lot of their old storyboards, a lot of their model packets, and a lot of stuff that was given from 
feature. It was like secondhand copies of stuff that they like model sheets and stuff that they did. And I remember I just was there every day as much as I can for an hour or two, either during my lunch or I would squeak, you know, sneak in as much time and I would make copies and I would like look at it. And that was my education. That was my textbook. I would like, look at these things. Oh, that's um, so cool. And I would like ask questions and, right. you know, I would ask storyboard guys and like, well, why are you doing this? And mm-hmm. I was with a whole bunch of great people. And, you know, that was my education. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. So cool. So yeah. after Pepper Ann, uh, yeah, after Pepper Ann, I, I was a storyboard revisionist for a year and a half. And one artist tanked on his board. I think, um, <laughs> either he just either quit or, or something. And so the crew was desperate and they were like, we need, we need somebody. And I volunteered. And that's how I became revisionist to storyboard artist. Oh, it's so awesome. And so, you know, your, um, drawing style and I'm using that term very loosely, but you know, your the, the affect, the the aesthetic of your drawings are so distinctive and, and beautiful. And and oh, there's this, um, it, but it's very specific. There's a very you know kind of very specific kind of John Navarez energy. And we were just discussing it a little bit uh, earlier. But uh, d- did your drawings that you were doing, especially when you became a board artist, you know, how much of what we know now as a John Navarez drawing do you feel was present at that time? How much of it was was as gestural and whimsical, like, for example, in the way we discussed earlier? Um, I don't know. It's funny. John Navarez, I don't know what that is, but I just know that <laughs> um, looking at a lot of early storyboards, I was, you know, looking at a lot of storyboards, I realized storyboards could be a lot of different things. They could be super, super rough or some could be just a little bit tighter and they could have like a marker tone at the time, you know, nothing was digital. So everything was done in marker or pencil tone. But I just remember there was a lot of levels of different types of boards, but they all said the same thing. And I remember, I mean, they were just all good and clear. And the ones I gravitated towards were the ones that were still loose, but still had energy and they were still clear. It's amazing that you found this path so early and that even that kind of storyboard work was such a perfect fit for even just the earliest things you were in touch with in terms of, of your art. Right. I mean, you were, I mean, you've made a career out of gesture in one way or another, which is, which is amazing. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've just been fortunate that I, I actually can stay rough. And, and still do this. Um, I've tried cleaning up. I really have. I mean, I've tried cleaning up my boards, but I, uh, I know uh, it's not fun and I don't enjoy it, mm-hmm. but I can still say the same thing in a rough sketch. And, I, and what's great is I think I've been very fortunate where people kind of respond to my rough sketches where it's actually, I, I've been lucky enough where I can just keep it a rough sketch. Mm. You know, when it comes to design, I have to clean it up more. Sure, and, of course. And, that, and, and I've gotten more comfortable with it, but I still do love the spontaneity of you know, yeah. the idea there. Yeah. And well, and that's the, that's the trick, right. Is, is still doing the work, which you, you know, have done, uh, beautifully. I mean, your layouts from monsters Inc or monsters university and, and that, I mean, those are as tight as they need to be for the production. So it's like you're, and they're beautiful. Oh, thank you. Insanely beautiful. Yeah, you're right. But it's like, but there's still, even in those, there's a unity, like you can still feel the gesture in that, in those layouts. Like you can still feel the presence of that energy, even though, uh, it, you know, obviously you just had to put more time. I mean, just more hours in getting those, uh, up to the level of resolution that, uh-huh. that the, the production requires. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I try. I mean, I just, you know, it just, I think I was just really lucky to be inspired by so many of these great books early on that, right. you know, I just kind of like, Oh, I want to be like them. I want to yeah. just try and create their beautiful energy. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And the fact that that was just so foundational, you know, and, and then, and then the fact that your foundation by comparison to a lot of artists start your, especially your, uh, the foundation of what you're doing now, right. Started really late compared to a lot of people, you know, the yeah, fact that you didn't yeah. even really discover animation as a, in your, in being in your mind, a viable career choice until Lion King, until you were, you were out of uh, college, in fact. Yeah, yeah, it was it was late, but that's okay. I mean, yeah, you know, it, I you know I realize it's it's okay, and I'm you know a lot of times early on, I wish I was like, oh, I wish I started my career earlier. I wish I I made a decision to go into art earlier or whatever like that. And yeah, you know, but at, in hindsight now, especially now, it's like no, yeah. I wouldn't change a thing. You know, it, I 
appreciated it more. And I met all the people that I did and all the opportunities that happened. It's, it's in hindsight, you realize, you know, oh, it was, it, it, it was a reason for why it happened. And I'm glad it did. In part two, John and I talk about what the first day at Pixar is really like, sneaky ways to get your work noticed, and the secret to staying sane in this crazy business. Please join the conversation in the comments at oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash JN1. That's J as in John, N as in Navarez, and the number one. Oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash JN1. And here's the discussion topic. Growing up, John didn't consider art to be a career path. He just knew that art made him happy. Until The Lion King. He was so inspired by the film that he made it his mission to become part of the animation world. Who or what in your life first introduced you to art as a career? And if you are a professional, what steps did you take to go from passionate to professional? Please share your thoughts in the comments just below the blog post associated with this podcast episode. Again, the link oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash JN1. As an Oatly Academy student, you get access to extended producer's cut versions of our podcast interviews. You can hear almost an hour of extra audio in the extended version of my interview with John Navarez. Plus, you'll get access to extended interviews with art cast favorites like Claire Keane, Armand Serrano, Jason Brubaker, and Jen Ely. At the time of this recording, we have two courses available. The Magic Box, where you'll learn how to become a digital painting wizard with hundreds of pro workflows, techniques, and time savers demonstrated step by step. And we also have the Storyteller Summit, where you'll learn to craft transcendent stories from some of the entertainment industry's best teachers. Join today at oatleyacademy.com forward slash courses. And don't forget to join the Brush Club. You'll get free Photoshop brushes, brushes that I made, every single month for a year, and a how-to video to go with each new brush set. Join the Brush Club today at oatleyacademy.com forward slash go forward slash Oatly Brushes. Thank you as always for listening, my friends. Until next time, stay strong and stay close. The Artcast is a production of the Oatley Academy of Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatley, your host and producer. My assistant producers are Anya Marcos and Ejua Ebenepa. Kevin Chandler edited this episode. Mara Roberts and I wrote the copy. The music is by Storybook Steve and Kangaralian. Find more art and story podcasts designed to help you make a living from your own imagination at oatleyacademy.com forward slash shows. Mm-hmm.